good evening and welcome. Gary, Kareem, Ambassador John, which I'm not going to call you John, I'm going to call you Ambassador John. We had the discussion upstairs. We have a new Iranian president, a new American president, and a bigger turmoil in the Middle East. May we live in interesting times, as the Chinese say. <laughs> um, Gary, I want to start with you. Um, I want you to tell us some basic facts about the joint uh, comprehensive plan of action, JCPOA or the Iran deal. What are its strengths and weaknesses, and if you can tell us if Iran is in compliance. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so the nuclear deal um, imposes physical constraints uh, on Iran's nuclear program in terms of the number of centrifuges and the amount of low enriched uranium and heavy water and so forth that it can possess. <clears throat> and it also imposes uh, much more intrusive inspection um, methods in order to ensure that Iran is complying with the agreement. Uh, in exchange, Iran gets sanctions relief, especially sanctions relief on its access to the international financial market <clears throat> and on its ability to sell oil. So far, the Iranians have complied with the agreement, um, as verified by the International Atomic Energy Agency. In fact, since President Trump has taken office, the Iranians have been scrupulous about complying with the agreement because they fear that President Trump might take advantage of any uh, question about compliance or any ambiguity by uh, leaving the agreement. When President Obama was in office, the Iranians were playing games, testing limits. They would go over the amount of allowed low enriched uranium or heavy water in order to see how the administration would react. Since Trump has taken office, the Iranians have not gone over the limits by an ounce uh, or an inch. And I think it reflects the fact that they, especially President Rouhani, is benefiting from the agreement, even though the Iranians complain they're not getting all the sanctions relief they wanted. Nonetheless, they recognize that if the deal collapsed, it would have a very significant impact uh, on the Iranian economy, on plans that Rouhani has that, that my fellow panelists can talk about in more detail. And so far, the deal has held. The Iranians have complied. And even though Trump, <clears throat> of course, criticized the deal during the campaign, the U.S. really doesn't have a practical option to leave the agreement as long as Iran is in compliance because there are other countries that are party to the agreement, um, Russia, China, um, the British, French, and Germans. They support the agreement. They see it working well, and if the U.S. were to leave without cause, we would be blamed and it would be very difficult for us to reconstruct the coalition that made the sanctions pressure possible in the first place. So I think the deal in and of itself continues to be stable. The big question, and I know we'll talk about this in the course of the discussion, is the extent to which the U.S. and Iran competing on other important areas in the Middle East, in Yemen and Syria and Iraq, how much of that can bleed over and jeopardize the survival of the agreement? Can we stay still on the JCPOA? I want you to spell it out for us in technical terms. Where was Iran before the deal and where is it now? Right. With regards to the heavy water reactor, the um, mothballing of the uh, spinning of the centrifuges and all of that, please. So, you know, before the agreement uh, went into force, there were no constraints on Iran's ability to manufacture and install centrifuges and stockpile low enriched uranium. And one measure of how close Iran was to producing nuclear weapons is something called breakout time, which is basically how quickly it would take Iran to produce enough uh, highly enriched or weapons-grade uranium for a single device. It's, it's a bit of an artificial measure, but it's just one way in which one can quantify the advancement of Iran's, of Iran's program. So they were you know, about a couple of months away when the agreement went into force. They're now, I would say, you know, at least a year, if not further away, from being able to produce um, enough weapons-grade uranium from a single device. And in terms of the heavy water uh, plant, they were building a reactor. It, I think, was probably a couple of years away from completion. But now the reactor <clears throat> has really been dismantled and destroyed. So they would have to start from scratch, and it would be many more years before they could finish and operate such a reactor. In many ways, I think, beyond the physical constraints, I think the intrusive inspections and the mechanism for snapping back uh, sanctions if the Iranians cheat is probably, in some ways, even more important 
because Iran, in the course of its nuclear program, when they were pursuing nuclear weapons, they did it in, at secret facilities, not at declared facilities, because <clears throat> it would be too easy to be detected at the declared facilities, which are subject to international inspection. So in my view, those sort of extra verification and inspection measures, which makes it very hard for Iran to cheat, uh, have been quite effective so far. Uh, but they need to be bolstered by strong intelligence. And I think the U.S. and its allies uh, in Europe and Israel have continued to watch the Iranian program very carefully. And so far, we haven't detected any effort by Iran to cheat. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Karim, I want you to tell us about the presidential elections. It was just held on May 19th, in which the incumbent Rouhani won a handily victory over um, Ray City Hardliner um, over a mandate of economic recovery. And you wrote an article uh, comparing the Iranian elections to a carnival where uh, the challenger Ray C, uh, was a Khamenei minimi. And you basically argued that any win for any candidate is a victory for the supreme leader. Um, can you elaborate? Can you clarify that a little bit for us? Sure. First, it's wonderful to be here. As Tom mentioned, I'm very proud to have been in Asia, 21 fellow, uh, 10 years ago. I'm hoping to join the Middle Age has been fellows pretty soon. Uh, and it really is an honor to be here with Gary and John and Nazi, really three of my favorite colleagues. Um, so presidential elections in Iran, I think as most of you know, it's always a, 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 it's a competition to see who is going to be Iran's second most powerful person. And I can, I can say second most powerful man, because when you talk in, about Iranian politics, you don't have to be gender neutral. Only men can uh, run for the presidency. And I'm always reminded of a quote from the late Israeli uh, President Shimon Peres. He was asked years ago about the prospects for an Israeli-Palestinian peace deal. And he said, the good news is that there's light at the end of the tunnel. And the bad news is there's no tunnel. <laughs> and so when, when I look at Iranian presidential elections, you watch this incredibly vibrant uh, young society that really wants to be integrated with the outside world, wants to be part of the outside world. Um, I think they, they every four years show um, substantial political maturity, certainly by regional standards. Um, but democracy is allowed to bloom for about one week every four years, and autocracy is evergreen in Iran. And so I noticed, I mean, I, I covered three presidential elections in Iran, and it does feel like a carnival atmosphere because the regime uh, allows, they, they kind of are, are somewhat lax with social restrictions uh, that week, somewhat with political restrictions. They want to invite the world's media to come to Iran to to chronicle the great democratic elections. Um, but I do think it, it, it is somewhat misleading because you know I have a friend of mine who's an, uh, he's a pilot, and he says that pilots like to joke that flying involves long hours of boredom punctuated by short moments of terror. And I, I think uh, political life in Iran is kind of short days of euphoria followed by long years of disillusionment. So the bottom line is I don't think that this election really changes any of the fundamentals in Iran. The people who were in power um, one month ago, the Supreme Leader and the Revolutionary Guards still control the military, they control state media, they control the judiciary. Um, when and if they want to uh, crack down on, on the media, on the more moderate forces, they can do so. Uh, but I think it's just another sign that this is a society which is uh, eager to be South Korea, not North Korea. And so um, that's why over the long term, I am hopeful about Iran. But in the near term, um, I don't think it's really going to change Iran's foreign policy, nor is it going to meaningfully change Iran's domestic policies. Thank you, Karim. I wonder what long term means when we're talking about an ancient civilization like Iran. <laughs> yes. It's not in our lifetime, maybe. <laughs> Uh, Ambassador, it's a personal, pl personal pleasure to be sitting next to you. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, you speak Farsi fluently. You're very comfortable with the culture and civilization. Um, a book that I'm also using for my dissertation is called Negotiating with Iran. And on the first page of the book, you have dedicated it to your Iranian wife. And you have said, and I quote, uh, 
who has taught me many lessons in the art of negotiation. <laughs> Do you think um, President Trump's art of the deal has any similarities to the Iranian art of the deal? <laughs> There, there is a, an expression, another expression in Persian. First of all, let me join my colleagues in saying how happy I am to be here. Um, I still remember vividly about three or four years ago, the Asia Society brought David Ignatius, Tom, uh, Ambassador Tom Pickering, and Ambassador Hazai here for an amazing discussion and generously allowed me to bring about 30 or 40 of my midship, midshipmen students to come, and they asked me, what should you expect? And I said, well, from Ambassador Pickering, you will hear a very seasoned diplomat. From Ambassador Hazai, you are likely to hear a list of grievances. <laughs> and believe it or not, that's exactly what they heard. Um, and we all know, of course, what they are. Uh, uh, what they, what they are. Uh, but going back to your question again, please. I mean, whatever you're, what, what you're saying is also fascinating. But, I mean, the Iranian media has heralded President Trump just before uh, his election as a person they can do business with. Okay. Do you see that? Uh, I do. I, uh, not, not under present circumstances. Okay. Uh, now, there is an interesting uh, current that has gone through Iranian politics both pre- and post-revolution. That is, in general, um, the Iranians have, whether they're Islamic Republic or the monarchy, they have favored American Republicans. Um, we know there were difficulties between the Shah and President Kennedy. We know there were difficulties with President, Car with, with, with President Carter. And the standard, um, the, the, the standard explanation is, well, these are business people, and they're not... They don't worry about things like human rights. They don't worry that much um, about democracy. Uh, um, about democracy. Uh, but in terms of negotiation, negotiating style, negotiating style, um, I don't see it. You don't see it. I don't see it because what I see in one party um, in our president is something that the Iranians call Mardirendi. I, can I try? You Are translate you, it. You're just as good as every, it's, all the Iranians in the audience. It's, it's, I don't know how many Persian speakers are here, but <laughs> it means, uh, it means uh, to outsmart yourself. <laughs> uh, to, to drive a deal so far, so far that the whole thing collapses and you end up losing. Where you, in, uh, you, you, go, into, uh, you go into a nego negotiation. It's like the man who, who spends $500 to travel to Chicago because he can buy uh, a suit there for $50 less. Uh, and that's what I see. That, that's what I see in, some, in our, our, current pre our current president. Uh, he may be very proud of making, a de uh, of making deals and, make, and very proud of making uh, New York real estate deals, but he's operating in a very different, situ um, uh, very different situation and a very different political historical context uh, about which he seems to have no particular curiosity or interest as to how this context would, af would affect the kind of deal he needs, to, he needs to make. If he is interested in making a deal, you'd ask the question, why would he spend so much time and effort berating the other side? Okay, so I guess we'll leave that question <laughs> to when the deals are going to happen, hopefully, between the Iranians and the, and the president. Uh, Karim, I want to go back to you. Um, the U.S. and the Western Coalition is working with Iran to defeat ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Um, and you have written, I think, uh, very cleverly that Iran is playing both the arsonist and the firefighter in the region. Can you elaborate on that? And can you tell us if that's the case, if someone's playing both sides, as the way Iranians are, what's the right strategy with respect to Syria with Iran? And uh, is this a tactical alliance? Can we move forward without being harmed? 
<clears throat> well, it's a, it's a very difficult question, and I'm reminded of something I think Henry Kissinger once said. He said, when you're in government, oftentimes the big decisions are 51-49. And the question of whether to work with Iran, whether on a tactical basis or strategically against ISIS, is, is a difficult one. Because on one hand, um, Iran, in my opinion, is an arsonist in that its support for the regime of Bashar Assad in Syria, which is been complicit in 500,000 deaths, the displacement of 12 million people, um, gassing of women and children. That has certainly fueled Sunni radicalism. Likewise, Iran's support for Shia autocrats and militias in Iraq has also done so. Um, at the same time, Iran is on the front lines fighting against ISIS in, in, in Syria and Iraq. So it's the arsonist and it's the fire brigade. And, and um, I'm always reminded of a conversation I had with a a minister of state from, um, um, from Iraqi Kurdistan when ISIS first emerged and it captured Mosul. And I said to him, aren't you worried that enlisting the support of Shia radicals, Hezbollah and Shia militias and the Iranian Revolutionary Guards to kill Sunni radicals, doesn't that, actually, doesn't that potentially create more Sunni radicals than it eliminates? And I remember he said to me, listen, you're sitting here in Washington, D.C., I live in Erbil, about you know, three dozen miles from where ISIS currently is, and we don't have the luxury of waiting for the Norwegians to come and defend us from, from <laughs> ISIS. So I think that this is the reality that you faced when you're living in the Middle East, and there's no perfect solutions. I, I think, um, Gary, you, you, you had left the Obama administration before ISIS came to be, but I know this was a real challenge for them because they, they felt that um, it wasn't an act of uh, cooperation with Iran against um, ISIS. But, you know, at the same time, the enemy, uh, Iran is the enemy of, uh, of our enemy. I think, actually, the Trump administration does think differently about this issue. Um, Trump's national security advisors, um, many of them were protégés of General Petraeus in Iraq, and they hold Iran directly responsible for the death of over 1,000 U.S. soldiers in Iraq, and there is a far greater cynicism towards Iran than the Obama administration, which I think was really trying to bring about some type of a modus vivendi. So I'm, I'm, I don't think that the Trump administration is going to make an effort to work with Iran against ISIS. The question is whether they will make an active effort to actually confront Iran in in the region. I'm, I'm setting it up here yeah, for Gary, Gary to answer uh, yeah, that Yeah, Gary, go ahead. But before you do, I, I remember a conversation with General Petraeus said, I think you were there, Gary, also, that he said to me, uh, this is back when military option was on the table, he said when he goes around in diplomatic circles in Saudi Arabia and the Sunni <laughs> countries, uh, the first question is, what happens if you attack Iran? Uh, they were worried for that because Iran would be hostile and attack back. And then their second question is, what happens if you don't attack Iran? Mm. So with Saudi Arabia and this question, it's always if them, if you don't do yes. them, if you don't do it. So Gary, go ahead. So just to add to what Karim was saying, um, as Islamic State is defeated and driven out of Mosul and Raqqa, I think the risk of a clash between the U.S. and Iran and their respective proxies and allies becomes much greater. Uh, in the case of Iraq, there's going to be a scramble for influence. There's going to be a competition between the U.S. and Iran for maintaining influence in Baghdad. Uh, the U.S. wants to retain some presence, and I think the Prime Minister, um, um, the Prime Minister of Iraq, al-Abadi, wants to have the Americans there to continue training in some counterterrorism mission. I think Iran and its allies um, inside Iraq may be looking for ways to try to minimize, if not remove completely, uh, U.S. influence in Iraq. And the Iranians have a very strong position in Iraq through their Shia political allies, and including their armed wing, uh, the Shia Popular Mobilization Units. And what I fear is if that competition is not controlled through some kind of communication between the U.S. and Iran, uh, I think there's a danger that the Iranians will go back to what they were doing during the U.S. occupation of Iraq, which was basically providing support for Iraqi units that were killing um, American soldiers. Uh, you know, and as Kareem mentioned, all of the top people in the Trump administration in the defense area, Mattis and um, as well as McMaster, they hold Iran responsible for killing and wounding their comrades. So I think there's a very risky...
um, you know, scenario where you, this competition between the U.S. and Iran and Iraq for influence could turn bloody. In Syria, uh, as the Islamic State is defeated, it, op it creates a political vacuum where the friends of Iran are trying to fill that vacuum, the units and, and, and forces the U.S. is supporting are trying to fill that vacuum. We've already had two military clashes where the U.S. Air Force has attacked um, Iranian-supported Shia militia who are moving into an area that, uh, that we consider to be a threat to our people that are training. So I think once again in Syria, as uh, Islamic State is defeated and these political vacuums opened up, I think there's an increasing risk that there will be clashes between the U.S. and Iran, if not directly, then through our allies and proxies. So talking about escalation, um, I want to I want to bring in the terrorist attacks in Tehran yesterday, and I want to stay with uh, you, Gary. First, uh, there were a dozen people killed. ISIS Syria has claimed responsibility. More than uh, 50 people are injured. What are the broader implications yeah. of this attack, and does this mean that there is going to be even a sharper escalation in sectarian yeah. violence in the region? So I think this is a very dangerous situation. I'd be interested to hear what John and Kareem say, but my understanding is that. Uh, people in the Iranian government, and particular in the security agencies, really do believe that Saudi Arabia was behind this attack. Uh, I actually doubt they were, but nonetheless, they you know, point to the fact that the Deputy Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman gave a speech recently, who, and he said, we're going to take the fight to Iran. And of course, the, you know, the Iranians have always blamed Saudi for uh, being behind Islamic State, both uh, because they share a similar a very fundamentalist view of Sunni Islam and also because some of the money for Islamic State and some of the recruits come from Saudi Arabia. So I think there's a pretty high risk that the Iranians are going to look um, to um, try to, um, they're going to look to try to attack Saudi Arabia to avenge uh, these recent terrorist attacks. And the Iranians will do it not through a direct attack on Saudi Arabia, that's too dangerous, but they'll do it through their proxies. They'll do it through uh, you know, some of the local Shia in Saudi and Bahrain, or maybe they'll uh, try to work through Hezbollah. But I think there's a real risk that we're on the verge of a sort of tit-for-tat escalation between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and I don't think that's in U.S. interest. I mean, the fact of the matter is both, you know, Islamic State threatens both Saudi Arabia and Iran, and I think we should be looking for ways to try to work together against that threat, and I'm afraid that President Trump, President Trump's uh, unsubtle, I mean, we should be supporting and working with the Saudis, but I, I'm afraid that we have to do it in a sophisticated and careful way. Uh, uh, otherwise, I think we run the risk of, of uh, sort of feeding or, or increasing the danger of escalation between Iran and Saudi. And I thought the message of condolence that the White House put out was really not very, you know, generous or gracious. I think so there was an opportunity So we're going to come to that. There. We're going to okay. come to that because okay. that's, a, that's a separate question. But um, side note is that that uh, little clip of uh, Prince Bin Salman that says, Sanan um, al Marke ala Iran is the most watched now in the chat rooms and blogs and Twitter feeds of the Iranians uh, right now. So you can, uh, you can just gauge how they are um, so angry with Saudi Arabia at this point. Um, same question to you, Kareem. What are the broader implications of this terrorist attack for the region? Well, I agree with Gary that this escalation between Iran and Saudi Arabia is very worrisome. Um, there's that African proverb which says, when two elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. And when Iran and Saudi Arabia fight, it's Syrians, Yemenis, Iraqis, Lebanese. Um, it hasn't predominantly been Iranian and Saudi citizens until this attack happened uh, yesterday. Um, I think it is quite worrisome that Iran conflates Saudi Arabia and ISIS. The reality is that uh, ISIS poses a grave threat to Iran, but a far graver threat to Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. I mean, ISIS is a, is a group of Sunni radicals. They're never going to be able to conquer a country like Iran, which is 90% Shia. The city of Tehran is probably 95% Shia, but the spread of that type of ideology does really pose an existential threat to Saudi Arabia. And, um, you know, I, I think that the Iranian government has put their finger on something very powerful, which is that they've 
realized that Persian nationalism, in my opinion, often bordering on chauvinism towards Saudi Arabia, is something which unites Iranians from Qom to Los Angeles. Um, you know, people who are pious Shiites to people who are atheists who hate the regime do feel this very strong um, nationalism, which again, I, I think as of late, it's, it's bordering on chauvinism towards Saudi Arabia. And, and the danger in that is that when you have been saying now for years that Saudi Arabia is behind ISIS, Saudi Arabia is behind ISIS, and there's then an ISIS attack in Iran, you feel like you have to respond um, in a way against Saudi Arabia. So I, I think this is very, very worrisome. So, Ambassador John, um, Mr. Trump released a statement yesterday saying that, I, I actually think he, he used a poignant word or poignant language, but he said, we grieve and pray for the innocent victims of the terrorist attack in Iran and for the Iranian people who are going through such challenging times. We underscore that states that sponsor terrorism risk falling victim to the evil they promote. Are you okay with this message? What are your thoughts on this message? And if you were to change it, how would you have changed it? I would, I agree with Gary. Uh, it's, and not Kareem? <laughs> uh, and Kareem too, but particularly about the message. Okay. Mm. It's graceless. Yes. Um, I would have, not that, not that um, I was asked for advice. Uh, not when I was back in the government was I asked for advice. Or was my advice always followed? Uh, my advice would have been the same as I give to my students when they are writing their answers. Quit while you're ahead. <laughs> End it at the place where he talks about grieving. Right. If you notice, there was a message from the State Department, mm. which right. was essentially echoed those first one or two right. sent, uh, um, uh, one or two sentences. It's another principle of diplomacy. You don't insult the other side gratuitously. Mm. If you do it, you do it for a reason. You have a, you, you have a purpose. Uh, but the, the kind of gratuitous insult comes back to haunt you. And there are going to be times, as, uh, um, and I think, uh, I think my colleagues pointed, pointed this out, uh, what we are going to be needing is some very delicate, uh, diplomatic moves, for example, as, as, as Karim pointed out, the idea that the, the U.S. should not necessarily be encouraging uh, or pouring gasoline on this particular disagreement, but should be looking for ways that perhaps these two places, these two countries can cooperate um, against a common foe. Now, this is, this is not going to be easy. Uh, but it's going to take some sustained, patient, and rather delicate diplomacy. And frankly, um, I haven't seen much evidence of any of that so far. Now, maybe there are things going on um, behind the scenes. One hopes that there are. But maybe there are things going on. But if they are, yeah. um, we haven't seen them. We're going to come back to delicate diplomacy and President Trump uh, soon. Gary, um, you did your PhD dissertation on Saudi Arabia, and you're just coming back from Saudi Arabia. You were actually there when President Trump and the First Lady and Ivanka were there. You were telling me upstairs about the experience, which is fascinating. I want to ask you a very general question. When it comes to our interests and values, who is in line more with our, with our uh, interests and values? Is it Saudi Arabia or is it Iran? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I want to preface by saying that I don't think it's necessarily in U.S. interest to choose one side over the other. I mean, we have a set of interests that some of which are served by cooperating with Iran, some of which are served by cooperating with Saudi Arabia. So my advice to the president would be, you know, don't get in the middle of what is a very nasty religious uh, national dispute between uh, a Shia Persian country and a Sunni Arab country. I mean, I don't think we want to take sides. We want to try to manage, as John was suggesting. But just to be more precise, I mean, in terms of values, I think uh, one would find in Iran, which on the continuum of, you know, political freedom and democracy and culturally is probably a little bit closer 
to us. Saudi Arabia is a much more unusual country, much more different from our standards. Um, but what I found interesting in this last trip to Saudi Arabia is even in Saudi Arabia, there's a younger generation of relatively cosmopolitan, Western-oriented people who want a political and cultural change. And the Deputy Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, is trying to bring about some very ambitious uh, changes in Saudi economy and culture, including, you know, previously, uh, uh, you know, uh, completely, uh, you know, out of the question issues like allowing women to drive. Um, and we'll see how far he goes with that. But in terms of interests, I mean, if we just talk about cold geostrategic foreign policy interests, we're much more closely aligned with Saudi than we are with Iran. I mean, Iran opposes the U.S. almost across the board on uh, issues in the Middle East, whether it's, uh, you know, Israel uh, or Syria or Iraq, Yemen. I mean, these are all areas where the U.S. Uh, and Iran have uh, different uh, policies in which clash. Uh, whereas with Saudi Arabia, the U.S. is by and large uh, working with the Saudis on most of these issues. Um, which is exactly the right segue to the next question for both uh, you and uh, Kareem. Uh, any one of you, Tehran has tested 12 ballistic missiles since the implementation day and uh, continues to support terrorism, um, brinkmanship behavior in the Gulf with the fast boats and shooting into the air at the naval cruisers, the American naval cruisers. Um, not a wonderful um, course of action for, the, for Iran, but which begs, begs a bigger question. Why such a provocative behavior, Kareem? What is Iran gaining? Uh, I don't think Tehran is thinking anymore that this is the model to emulate for the Arab or the uh, Muslim world, or is it? Well, I think after the nuclear deal was signed, the hardliners, who are not certainly a, a minority throughout Iran, but perhaps a majority when it comes to the levers of power in, in, in Iran, you know, I, I think that they probably felt threatened. They feel threatened by uh, Iran's political integration and economic integration, and so they, they want to thwart that prospect. Um, that's why I've always thought a challenge for U.S. policy toward Iran is that when we um, sanction Iran, when we isolate them politically and economically, in some ways that's more of a carrot to Iran's hardliners than a stick, just like you know, Kim Jong-un in North Korea or Fidel Castro in Cuba. I think they appreciate the fact that they can um, preserve their power much easier in a closed environment rather than an open environment. I think one of the dangers right now in just kind of global geopolitics is that uh, five, six years ago you had Barack Obama in Washington and you had Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in Tehran and the Middle East before the Arab Spring appeared relatively stable and so I think that Obama's efforts, and here this is when Gary was at the White House, Obama made these unprecedented but unreciprocated overtures to Iran, which really helped uh, Gary and his colleagues rally this you know, robust international coalition against Iran. I think now the problem is that um, Hassan Rouhani and Javad Zarif are in the eyes of much of the world, including the Chinese, the Russians, and many of our European partners, they appear to be reasonable actors. Uh, in their eyes, Iran is actually a stable country in the Middle East. The last thing they want to do is destabilize yet another country in the Middle East. And it appears to much of the world that it's the United States which is being provocative, not uh, Iran and Ahmadinejad. So the reason why I say this is that if the nuclear deal starts to unravel, whatever provokes it, Iran's missile tests or regional conflagrations, and we sanction Iran, Iran resumes its nuclear activities, we're not going to have the same global coalition that we had five, six years ago. And if it's only U.S. pressure and U.S. sanctions, well, about 100% of Iranian trade is with countries other than the United States. So that's not going to, to compel Iran to, to put on the brakes. And so that's why I do think it's, there's so many crises happening in today's world. You oftentimes think, you know, we couldn't, couldn't possibly add another one. But, but I do think that... Um, there is a real risk of, uh, of some type of a conflict between the United States and Iran over the next 12 to 24 months. And I, I see you shaking your head, Ambassador. No, I certainly agree. Um, 
but why are uh, Iranians uh, uh, behaving? In terms of the do? potential of the de right. potential danger, I look. Uh, uh, Gary mentioned Iraq. Um, I look to the Persian Gulf. Um, I see my my students after they graduate, they are going to be on Navy ships. They're going to be on ships in the Gulf. Um, and what happens when some Iranian speedboat mm. starts do, performing? Very starts uh, doing. How can I put this? They 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 do an imitation of a Tehran taxi driver. <laughs> I, I'm sure that's where they recruit their boat drivers, too. I'm can, certain. Can, can you certain elaborate that. for the audience? I mean, I, I kind of remember what the Tehran taxi drivers used to do, but... Uh, <laughs> t t think of a New York taxi driver on steroids. <laughs> that's all I can say. That's all, that's all I can say. But they entertain you, They can go anywhere, anytime, turn any direction, anytime. Yes. Um, anyhow, completely unpredictable. Completely unpredictable. This is dangerous. This is very dangerous. Uh, can you rely, I mean, they, they get too close, can you rely on that young officer out there showing restraint? I salute them because they have until now, but it's not always, it's not always going to happen. Uh, this is operated not by the Iranian Navy, which by all accounts is quite professional, but by the Revolutionary, by the revolutionary Guards, who do not observe the simplest rules of the road. They do not answer bridge-to-bridge -bridge communication, for, exa uh, uh, for example. Uh, they will not agree to a military-to-military -military hotli um, um, hotline. This is dangerous. Now, it's more dangerous now than it was six, six months ago, because six months ago, our Secretary of State could pick up the telephone yes. and speak to his good friend Javad, mm -hmm. uh, Javad Zarif, and these problems which, could, which have the potent, would have the potential uh, to create a... Uh, if not an armed conflict, at least a major political crisis, could be resolved. As far as I know, that's not going, that doesn't happen today. I don't see our Secretary of State with that kind of relationship with his Iranian counterpart. I certainly don't see uh, this very, anything like the very productive um, relationship that Secretary of Energy Muniz had with Dr. Salahi, his counterpart. It's a little bit hard to see Secretary Perry uh, having such a having having such a relationship. So, so the the dangers come on any kind. You know, the small miscal small miscalculation. Um, uh, a ship goes too far. A, a boat goes too far. Uh, could lead to something very serious. And I don't see it right now. The mechanisms exist. Uh, for us to stop such a crisis. Uh, this is a uh, great opportunity to actually ask like a five-pronged question, but unfortunately, I have to narrow it down. Gary, do you think the unfree unfreezing of the $1.7 billion in assets, do you think, and the nuclear deal, do you think it has emboldened Iran? Because that's what the opponents of the deal have been arguing, right. including uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Yeah. I mean, I think Iran's behavior in the region was more or less the same before and after the nuclear deal. The only thing the nuclear deal does is constrain Iran's nuclear program. But, you know, before the deal, they were working to expand their influence in Iraq and Syria. They were testing ballistic missiles. They support uh, groups that we consider to be terrorists like Hezbollah and Hamas. They've done all that after the deal as well. So I do don't see do? it as... Then tell me, what, what do you do with, if a deal does not moderate Iran's behavior right. and if no deal doesn't know, so what is the right way of dealing with Iran? So I think, you know, the Trump administration's policy toward Iran in general is preserve the nuclear deal and try to push back Iranian influence in the region. I think that's a sensible approach. And I think, you know, frankly, Hillary Clinton would have followed a very similar approach. My concern is about execution about can the Trump administration, which is having, you know, serious problems, manning, uh, putting a full team in place, putting in place regular procedures for the interagency process, making sure the White House is coordinated with state and defense and so forth, this requires some subtly, subtlety and sophistication. Because I think as we've talked about, the situation in the region in particular is very delicate. And we want to push back on Iranian influence, but we don't necessarily want to create a crisis. And I, 
So what I worry about is not the overall strategy, it's implementation of policy, where I think the Trump administration just doesn't quite have their act together yet. Which requires communication. I think it requires communication with Iran. It also requires the ability to confront Iran when right. that's necessary. So it's a question of how you mix all those tools together in the most effective way. And so far, I haven't seen um, you know, a very sophisticated approach uh, uh, out of the Trump administration. Um, that's exactly where I wanted to ask the next question uh, from Kareem or any one of you that wants to um, opine. So there's been many essays and articles. Uh, one that I can uh, remember is by Elliot Abrams, who argued against a Rouhani victory, basically saying that uh, the world cannot rally against a Western-educated doctoral uh, uh, politician like Rouhani or Javad Zarif. We need an Ahmadinejad to be able to uh, coalesce our, 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 our uh, efforts together. So if we cannot do business with a Rouhani type and we did not like Ahmadinejad, who is the right president for us? <laughs> You're talking about here or there? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> Not going there, but Kareem, do you want to answer that question? Listen, I, I think um, these are my answer is going to not be satisfactory because you would like to be able to sit here and say, you know, if you just follow these three bullets, then you're going to be able to resolve the Iran question. And the reality is that um, you can't make amends, you can't make a deal with the regime which needs you as an adversary for their own internal legitimacy. And as long as the supreme leader is around, I think that's going to be the case. So I think basically Iran, U.S. policy toward Iran is, is a combination of three C's. And Gary's mentioned two of them. It's cooperate when you can. When you can't cooperate, you contain. And when you can't contain, there are times, I think, when you have to confront, particularly um, as Iran has been complicit in really the greatest humanitarian catastrophe since the Second World War in Syria. So that's, there, there's, not, um, there's not a silver bullet there. Obama wrote about half a dozen letters, I think, to the Supreme Leader, making it clear the United States is no longer in the business of where we don't want to do regime change. We want to cooperate with you. John Kerry spoke probably hundreds of times with Javad Zarif. If the Iranians ever wanted a deal with the United States, there was no better time with President Obama, Secretary Kerry uh, at the State Department. And, and again, if I were the advisor to the Supreme Leader, if I were his son, and my goal is to keep him in power, I wouldn't advise him to normalize relations with the United States because he's risen to the top and preserved his power in this closed environment. I think if he opens Iran up to the world, he normalizes relations with the United States, that's far more of an existential threat to him than continued, contained hostility. So it's a frustrating answer, but I think it's some version of what U.S. policy towards the Soviet Union was. You, you contain, you do arms deals when necessary. I think you try to intelligently support uh, Iran's progress and transformation to a more tolerant society. I don't think that the Trump administration has done any of these things well. Um, but there's no silver bullets, unfortunately. Thank you, Kareem. I, I have so many other questions, but our time is coming to a close. I wanted to ask the ambassador something that I've been personally trying to figure out for myself. Um, Mr. Trump has advocated an America First policy, and um, Ambassador, uh, the um, Iranian Revolution uh, has its own culture, its own imagery, its own narrative, but one thing that I see all the time the image of the American flag on the walls of the American embassy. And under the American flag, there is a big writing, Yankee, go home. And there is a smaller writing that says, and please take me with you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, President Trump wants us to go home. Uh, it's extricating its, its uh, influence and power from the Middle East or has been trying to do so or has been saying so. Isn't that exactly what the clerical regime wanted? I, I would not speak for the clerical regime. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I had a, in my, in my, during my 
uh, career as a, as a diplomat, and every time I say, refer to myself as a diplomat, my wife just laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> uh, uh, but in, uh, um, in fact, it's, um, there are in Iran in particular, but also in foreign policy in general, there, things are very often schizophrenic. Uh, you want one thing, and at the same time, you want the opposite. Uh, we would like, I personally, for example, would like to see a government in Iran uh, that treats its people decently, uh, that observes standards of human, ri human rights, uh, that calls out, uh, uh, <laughs> calls out somebody for, calls out another country uh, for using poison gas against its own uh, uh, against its own people. I mean, who of, who the Iranians of anybody should be denouncing something like the uh, uh, something like this? But it's not. It's it, the question is we we play the hand we play the hand we're dealt. Uh, and if you say America for if you say um, America first, then uh, why are we getting involved? with Saudi Arabia and this, the internal quarrels with, uh, uh, between Saudi Arabia and its Gulf, uh, uh, Gulf neighbors? Why are we getting involved in the quarrel between Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, um, Iran at all? I think it was Tom Friedman who once wrote, uh, it's usually a bad idea to get involved in other people's five-sided conflicts that have gone on for 1,500 years. <laughs> um, our record of, and our record of choosing governments for other peoples isn't really very good. <laughs> they don't work out, uh, 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 they don't work out well. Um, Iran, you know, I'm sure every president, look at the experience of President Carter, of President Reagan, with Iran, it was appalling. President Carter graduates, gradu a graduate of that wonderful institution where I teach now, uh, lost his presidency because of Iran. Mm. Ronald Reagan almost lost his presidency because of, uh, of Iran. And others, presidents, whatever they tried, nothing seemed to work. They would have liked to ignore Iran. They would have liked to have not to deal with it. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, you can't do it. You can't do it. Iran is a little bit like that famous, the paraphrase, that famous phrase from a, another New Yorker. You know who I mean. I mean Leon Trotsky, <laughs> who once said, you know, war, you may have no business with war, war has war. business with you. Exactly. Well, like it or not, Iran has business with us, and we need to figure out some way to, de some way to deal with it Intelligent, um, uh, intelligently, and in in uh, accordance with our own val our own values and standards. Well said. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a question uh, from the email question. Um, it's for all three of you, and I think it's uh, important. It was one of my questions also. Help us, please, to understand how the news from Qatar, and I want to add myself, Yemen and recent actions by the other Gulf nations affects the U.S.-Iran relationship. Gary? So let me talk about Yemen, because when I, was Saudi, when I was in Saudi, I discovered that from the Saudi standpoint, of all the battlegrounds, uh, battleground states with Iran, Yemen is the most important to the Saudis. But to the Iranians, it's the least important. I mean, from, from Iran's standpoint, they have a very strong interest, even a vital interest, in Syria and Iraq and retaining their influence there. But for Iran, Yemen is just a way to bleed the Saudis. And the Iranians are, of course, delighted that Saudi Arabia has now found itself stuck in this uh, conflict um, uh, and really using a lot of their military resources. I think the challenge for the Trump administration, on one hand, we want to help the Saudis um, in order to uh, uh, create conditions for a political settlement in Yemen. Um, and the Trump administration has already approved additional weapons, and the Saudis have hopes of additional support in terms of intelligence and logistics and so forth. So we need to support them. But on the other hand, we I think we have to be quite active in terms of trying to cobble together a political settlement. 
because as people often say about many of these conflicts, there's not going to be a clean military victory. I mean, the worst thing the Saudis could do would be to send their army into Yemen and try to capture Sana'a. This would be a, a real disaster for the Saudis. But when you talk to the Saudis, their view about what a political settlement looks like seems pretty extreme. I don't think they've come around to accepting that some kind of power-sharing arrangement with the Houthis and with the former president, Abdullah al Saleh, is the only conceivable political settlement. And this is another case where the U.S. requires both support for our ally, but also an effort to try to manage their expectations so that you achieve a political settlement. And I, I think it's still early. I think there's still plenty of time. But so far, I'm not sure that we're putting together both of those pieces. So unless you want to add something, I want to uh, take the questions to the audience. Sure. OK. Uh, if you have any questions, just raise your hands. Right there, please. The gentleman, yes, please stand up. I'll wait for the microphone, please. Mm -hmm. This work? Yes, okay. we can hear you. Uh, actually, two quick questions. One, um, during the Iranian election, there seemed to be um, a big internal issue over economic uh, inequality in Iran, which seemed to parallel our own a year ago. And I was just wondering if you can comment on that or if there's something we can learn from them or them, they can learn from us. And the second one is that the Iranian nuclear program was one of the first targets of uh, sophisticated cyber weapons, and just any thoughts on whether we can control um, cyber warfare in the future? Thank you. Gary should do cyber. Cy yeah. yeah, you were just coming back from uh, Saudi Arabia and cyber program. Uh, John, do you want to take the inequality question? The, the question on the, 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 the question on the election, uh, you know, it, it's really, it's, it, was, it was interesting to me. What, what I saw in the, elec uh, in, the, in the election, and I'm going to quote Kareem here because I, I often do, <laughs> is I what you were well. seeing after, um, af after 37 years, 38 years, I think you are seeing change. Um, I'm not quite so pessimistic. Uh, things are changing. And one of the reasons things are changing is that the, the population, the message from the population was very clear. We reject this group of 20 to 25 senior clerics who have been in power and occupied all of the key positions since 1979. We reject them. Right? E.C. was definitely one of them. The fact that he was uh, supposed to be anointed, the anointed of Khamenei, also a member of that group. But the important thing is this group is passing from the scene. And here's where I'll quote Karim. Karim talks about this group and he says, the average age of this group is deceased. <laughs> <laughs> and I have stolen that from him many times. Uh, uh, many times. And the, mess and, and the population has changed. The population, as I, the, the, the Iran that I re remember from 37, 38 years ago, it's very different. It is aware, it is sophisticated, people are savvy, the literacy rate is well over 90 uh, percent. There are universities now in many of the small t uh, in many of the small towns. It's a, and if you look at the the creativity, particularly among women. In, uh, in Iran, it's, uh, um, it's amazing. And the message is very clear. We're not going to put up with the way things were. We know the establishment, the people in power, they don't ask us for our opinion very often. But when they do, on that rare occasion, every once every four, four years, we are going to make our opinion very clear. And, I, and the message, I think, in this case was a, was a very clear one. Okay. Do you want to quote from yourself? <laughs> uh, just a couple of things. One is, and John is always so generous, uh, um, the, the, uh, maybe I, I just kind of have started to temper my expectations about Iran because when I first started covering it, I just thought change was imminent. And then every four years, it was like Charlie Brown's football being pulled away, and I have seemingly now kind of come to the, 
same conclusion, Ibn Khaldun once said this about empires that they are built and destroyed over three generations. In the first generation, they're really hard-nosed, they're, they're vigilant, they, they build it. The second generation has had observed what the first generation built and they preserve it. And by the third generation, there's just kind of these palace-reared uh, princelings who end up losing it. Now, the Pahlavi government didn't even get to the third generation, they got to the second generation. The Islamic Republic is just now entering the second generation of leadership. Ayatollah Khamenei comes from still the first generation. When you talk to the grandchildren of these folks, they have a very different uh, outlook. They're, they're not, you know, uh, uh, hardline uh, revolutionaries. But, but I, I guess the final thing I'd say is that when the uprisings were happening in Iran in 2009, and some of you may remember, you know, millions of people took to the street. I remember asking a son um, of a very prominent uh, cleric, I asked him, how many supporters does um, Khamenei and Ahmadinejad really have? Because they seem to be significantly outnumbered by you know, these young people in the streets whom we, whom we all want to succeed. And he said, you know, what matters most in authoritarian regimes like Iran is not the breadth of your support, but it's the depth of your support. Meaning, if you have a couple hundred thousand people who are willing to go out there and kill for you and to die for you, that's more potent than five million people who will say nice things about you on Facebook. And, and the reality is the Islamic Republic of Iran does have a monopoly over coercion. They have the Revolutionary Guards and they have the Basij Militia. And I say this about the Iranian population. In 1979, they experienced a revolution without democracy. Today, they want democracy without a revolution. And I think for that reason, the pace of change is, is going to be pretty slow. Uh, the elections look like a step forward. I think we will see some signs in the, in the coming months and years. Maybe we take a step backward. I think the general prognosis is, is positive. It's heading in a positive direction. Um, but, but I think there's going to be a lots, of, uh, lots of back and forth. Gary, cyber warfare? So since the uh, famous Stuxnet attack against Iran's uh, centrifuge program, there's been a very significant increase of state-sponsored uh, cyber attacks. Uh, I mean, it's, none of this has been admitted, so it's just what's in the newspapers. But you have what is suspected to be an Iranian attack against the Saudi oil company Aramco that destroyed a large number of computers. You have the North Korean attack against Sony in retaliation for a movie that was unflattering about Kim Jong-un. That destroyed a lot of computers. Uh, of course, we have the Russian hacking in the U.S. election. I think this is the face of the future. I, I think that there are so many attractions to governments to use cyber technology against their enemies, not only to collect information, but also cyber sabotage and so forth, that, and there's no international system for controlling it. So I think we're going to see this kind of thing happening more and more, and it's going to put a premium on defense. I mean, I think we all, uh, all of us in our personal lives have experienced, you know, efforts uh, to break into our unclassified email. I've had two uh, uh, instances in which I'm told hackers from Russia have broken into my email. Unfortunately, the computer security people were able to detect it and, and deal with it. But I think this is just going to become something that is, uh, becomes very commonplace. And the best defense is defense. Next question. Bill, wait for the microphone. Um, my, my question, uh, I just wanted to say something, I think, uh, to your point about uh, President Trump setting up uh, his team and getting the right people in place, I think it would be a wonderful first uh, to have a female representing us uh, to Iran uh, that looks terrific and is brilliant and anything she wears, red, white, or blue. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also want to say, uh, as president of the Intrepid Museum here in New York for almost 20 years, uh, my passion has always been about uh, people and those that serve our country. And I, I just want to say anybody who's uh, held for a year and 79 days as a prisoner of war deserves our gratitude and applause. Uh -huh. um, so thank you. <laughs> And uh, 
two quick questions along those lines. One, uh, very quickly, um, when I was at the Intrepid, Susie Halpin uh, used to work at Rubenstein, as she still does, uh, did a great job representing great uh, people in New York City, uh, one of which was Donald Trump, one of which was George Steinbrenner, and one of which was the Intrepid. And her brother, who has seven children, is a man by the name of uh, Robert Levinson. And uh, he uh, worked as an FBI agent for many years, whether he was in Kish Island or not, for whatever reason, is none of my business. Um, first question is, how do we get our American citizen home to his seven children and his wife, Christine? And secondly, uh, having visited uh, Erbil and met with uh, the Barzani family, and I went out to the front, actually uh, 20 clicks outside of the capital of Kurdistan, uh, with Speaker Kukut. Uh, it seems like we love when the Kurds uh, fight uh, and stand up as the major force against ISIS uh, to get all of our tanks back that were stolen from the uh, Iraqi army who just walked away uh, when the ISIS came in to get them. Uh, and why are we not supporting uh, the independence of Kurdistan, who has earned it, in my opinion, um, and who keeps getting shelled from uh, Iran and Turkey and everywhere else. And they're losing tons of people to uh, better the world and rid ISIS from it. So Bill, can I just take the first question because it, it's pertinent to the panel and, and skip over the second question, and I hope you don't mind in the interest of time. So um, Ambassador, how do we negotiate with Iranians to get Mr. Levinson out? With great difficulty. Um, I worked on that case. Uh, when I was back in the State Department, 2000, 2009, my first day on the job, um, I had come out of retirement, given up my teaching post to, to go and do this, and my, my first day on the job, I was told, you're going to a meeting with Secretary Clinton and the Levinson family. Mm -hmm. Very tough. That particular case, there were others who have been held we had three hikers, for example, you may remember, who were released. We've had Iranian-Americans, some of whom have been released, some of whom have not been released. But those are more or less understandable. They're tragic, they're awful, they're very difficult. Uh, personally, they're very difficult for me. But the Levinson case, seven years, the Iranians will not even admit that they hold, they, they hold him, that have, they do not admit they, that they have him. And basically, you do, in a case like this, you do what you always do. You keep coming at them. And you use every occasion, every contact. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about finance or business or nuclears or cyber or something else. You always say, the, the, the Levin, uh, bring up the Levinson case. Uh, and you just have to keep it out there. And I'm glad you raised it uh, because the fear is, of course, that he is going to be for, uh, uh, forgotten. The, se the, the other difficult thing is we don't even know if he's alive. Mm -hmm. The last um, evidence of his being alive was it 2011, I think, from back about 2000 and 2011. Since then, there's been no, no, no trace of it. Uh, but for our citizens, that's what we do. And for our people, that's what we do. Thank you for asking that important question. Um, Please go ahead, right there. Hi. Um, so, um, Dr. S uh, Mr. Seymour said that Iran uh, was told to leave a little closer to the U.S. of Saudi Arabia. I assume you could read with that more. Um, <laughs> Iran, Saudi Arabia is a country that's named after a family whose constitution is the Quran, whose state religion is the basis of the ideology of ISIS. Iran is a country with a century-long struggle for democracy since 1906. It is a vastly young, educated population, open to the world. They're actually elections. They're female members of parliament. Um, so I think that uh, statement um, is uh, quite false. And um, I think it's in part based in the, um, the long hostility that has existed between Iran and the US since the, um, since the revolution and the Iran hostage crisis. And I know that. Um, Ambassador Limbert, who was himself a hostage, um, I believe I read at some point that you very graciously um, said you have forgiven your hostage takers, if I'm not mistaken, and, and having come out of that, ex um, am, I, am I correct or am I 
Um, okay, I, I remember reading something like that on the Golf 2000 network. Um, do you have a question? And yes, the question is, um, it seems like there was actually, uh, finally it emerged that there may be a tunnel and there may be a light at the end of the tunnel with the Iran nuclear deal. Um, there have been deep psychological scars, I believe, since the Iran hostage crisis, since the revolution. And um, Iran and America do seem to have very common interests in the region and culturally to be quite uh, much closer than certainly uh, Saudi Arabia. The question is, what do we do to keep the Iran nuclear deal alive and to prevent another conflict from happening in the region? So let me start. Um, you know, yes, I agree with you that Iran's culture is much more familiar to us than Saudi culture. But I'm trying to avoid getting into a situation where I cast, ask, you know, it, I mean, any kind of, you know, uh, uh, unflattering statements about another country's culture. I mean, people have different histories and culture, and you know, obviously, I don't think there's anything to be served because I think in both the case of Saudi and Iran, you have interesting, as I mentioned, interesting cultural changes that are underway. Uh, much slower in Saudi Arabia. It's a much more conservative, closed society. Iran has obviously had much more you know, contact with Europe and the outside world and so forth. Very different situations. But I don't want to get into a situation where you say one country is better than another in terms of their cultural heritage and so forth. I don't see any value in that. In terms of the sort of how do you preserve the nuclear deal, I, you know, I think it continues to be in both the U.S. interest and the Iranian interest for the deal to be in place. And as long as the deal is working, as long as the U.S. is getting the benefit of constraints on Iran's nuclear program, Iran is getting the benefits of um, some sanctions relief, then I think there's a strong argument for the deal to continue. And as I said, I don't think either side at this point is likely to walk away from the agreement. The bigger danger, I think, is uh, a, a spillover from these various regional clashes and differences where there are, between the U.S. and Iran, there are many, many significant areas where we disagree, where we have conflicting interests. And I think that requires management. It requires both sides to manage, as you know, Kareem said, we have competition in some areas, we have common interests in other areas. And I am uh, concerned, because I haven't seen from the Trump administration much evidence that there uh, um, you know, in a position where they can pursue that kind of a policy that requires some sophistication and nuance. So also to your point, and I'm, I'm going to take one more question from here, but before I go to the question, to your point, uh, a contemporary Iranian philosopher by the name of Abdul Karim Surush has said that Iran is a child of Persian, Islamic, and Western influences. And a side note to that, which brings this home to me, is that in the runoff on the elections in Iran, the hardline Raisi um, asked the most famous Iranian rapper in Iran, a tattooed, shaved, pierced guy by the name of Tatali, I don't know, Karim, if you read that, to uh, campaign for him, um, to bring in the youth vote. And, you know, Iranians are cynical, and they saw through that right away, and actually it worked against him. But that just shows you that even in today's uh, Islamic regime in order to attract the younger population, you go through that Western influence, that the child of West that Iran is supposedly uh, part of. So it's, uh, it's another enigmatic part of Iran. The last question right here. Thank you. I'm Raghi Dadaram of Al-Haya and Beirut Institute. I want to ask uh, particularly Karim, in fact, about and anybody in the panel, you choose, actually. Uh, I want to ask about the Russian dimension in the relationship with Iran. So how are we going to uh, convince the Russians to give up Iran as a strategic partner, for example, in Syria, if there is no conversation and no real serious going back and forth on a political level with, with, with Russia because of, of the internal situation here in the United States? So what are they thinking in Washington? How, how are they going to curb the appetite of Iran in the regional space where it operates? Uh, are we talking about, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's wonderful that the Europeans are in love with, with uh, President Rouhani and Jawad Zarif. Good for them. Well, let's hear what they have to say about Qasem Soleimani, who is, of course,
the wars and the militias in Syria, in, uh, in, in of course, Iraq, and of course, running Hezbollah in Lebanon. What, what's the thought in Washington? What should there be uh, approach, the constructive approach? And please, if you don't mind, to answer the question that came through the internet, through the email, about the developments with Qatar. How dangerous are these? What impact will they have on Iran's situation, in fact, in the region, uh, if they, in fact, the, the, you know, the GCC countries fall apart? Thank you. Karim, you want to take um, So, good questions. Uh, Raghida is a famous journalist, always asks good questions. So, uh, on Qatar first, uh, one of the, I think, more interesting revelations that came out of WikiLeaks was from the former emir of Qatar in a meeting with a U.S. official. Uh, he was asked about Qatar's re relationship with Iran. He said, it's pretty simple. Uh, we lie to them and they lie to us. <laughs> and so the notion that uh, Qatar is going, to be, um, is going to fall into the embrace of Iran and there's going to be an alliance between them, I think, is fanciful. And in some ways, the attack, the ISIS attack yesterday in Iran and the growing tension between Iran and Saudi Arabia, in some ways, I, I think, even accelerates... Um, the prospects of some type of a detente in which you know, Sunni uh, Arab Qatar goes back to its Sunni Arab brethren it may not happen over a period of, of weeks, but I think it's just a question of negotiating what are, what are the terms of that. When it comes to Russia, I have a very cynical understanding of Russian interests vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Uh, again, to quote Kissinger, again, Kissinger once said, there are few nations in the world with whom the United States has more common interests and less reason to quarrel than Iran. I would say the, precisely the opposite is true about Russia. There are few nations in the world with whom Iran has less common interests and more reason to quarrel than Russia. But what binds them at the moment is this tactical alliance against the United States. But of all the countries in the P5 plus one, China, Europe, the United States, Russia, I would argue Russia is the only one that really want, benefits from keeping Iran isolated. Um, they recognize that it, uh, an Iran which emerges from isolation, it can, it can uh, exploit its vast natural gas reserves. That's major competition to Russia's hold over European gas markets. I think they recognize the fact that there's a million Iranians living in the United States. It's a country which I would argue even President Rouhani would like to be aligned with the United States. You know, Iranians don't like to go and study in Moscow. They like to come in and study in the United States. So, so the only basis for their alliance is this mutual enmity, mutual fear towards America. And as long as the status quo regime remains in power, as long as it remains isolated, uh, Russia will continue to play the U.S. and Iran off of each other. I don't think Putin feels, that needs, feels the need to, quote unquote, give up Iran. What he'll do is he, he, as he did in the nuclear negotiations, he'll, he'll, si he'll uh, sign on to sanctions and tell the United States, you see, we've signed on to sanctions. But he'll water down those sanctions and he'll say to the Iranians, you see, we've, 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 we've uh, watered them down somewhat. But, but it's just a tactical alliance, which is ahistoric. It's not a natural, organic alliance. But I think it exists as long as, at least as long as Khamenei is supreme leader. Gary, I know you want to answer. So sure. just very quickly on the question of gutter, I agree with Kareem that I think this dispute, which of course is a long-running tension between the Saudis uh, and gutter, I think it'll blow over in part because I think the U.S. doesn't want this clash to get out of control since we have very strong security interests in both gutter and Saudi. And this is an area where I think the Trump administration has recognized the danger and President Trump himself has become more active. So I imagine there'll be some accommodation. Um, perhaps the leader of Hamas will have to find some other place to live. I don't know where it will be, but he may have to leave gutter. On Russia, I was, um, in both Israel and Saudi, I think there's a very unrealistic hope or expectation that somehow the U.S. and Russia will make a deal on Syria that will freeze out the Iranians, I think that's very mm -hmm. uh, unlikely. I think the Iranians have an incredibly strong position in Syria because Assad can't survive without them. 
And now we may be able to limit Iran's influence. They may not establish a port on the Mediterranean, which is sort of the Israeli nightmare. But I don't think we're going to be able to completely expel Iranian influence in Syria. And, you know, I think the tactical alliance with Russia will keep them there for the time being. John, do you want to finish? To, to me, um, ahistorical is the, is the thing. This, in, in, in the long term, uh, Iran's cooperation with Russia is not a sign of, it's a sign of Iran's weakness. Mm. Uh, that it feels itself so, iso so isolated in its, in its region uh, and so threatened in its region that it's forced to make an alliance with a historical enemies mm. whose traditional relations with, with its Muslim neighbors are just awful. Yes. Finally, I will quote Karim again <laughs> on this subject. And he said, best to think of this alliance as a celebrity marriage. <laughs> Maybe the Kardashians. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I have to conclude the program. I'm sorry if I'm not getting to all your questions. We were supposed to finish at 8. It's 8.05. Thank you for joining us tonight, and I hope you come back again. Thank you.